And now, our feature presentation. So where were we? Ten Commandments, yes, of course. And the honor of mother and father. And understanding, dear mother, dear father, dear parent, we are instruments and agents of God. It is natural to, to be attached and to love. And there's a natural bond that forms between the mother and her child. And that's why we must always honor mother and father because, particularly with mother's concern, look at what she goes through. I mean, look, those of us as men that were blessed to be in the operation room or the delivery room, how many fathers are here that were in that room when your child was born. Look at that. Was that some kind of experience? I know you, we strong men. None of us got faint, lightheaded. Man, look at this. My God. Let me tell you. Oh my God. See, and I had twins. The first one came out so fast. Bloop. If I had been five minutes late coming in there, I would have missed the birth of the first one. But to, and then another one, I was like, God, what is this? I mean, you get, you know, you, you hold on to something. But, but brothers, does she not deserve better? That's the point. She deserves the best that we can give her because she produces life for us and allows us to extend ourselves again and again and again and again. She gives her life for our children. And she can sometimes, you know, you know how you all can be during those days of pregnancy and one o'clock in the morning. Baby, I want some chocolate. I got a taste for some potato chips. There ain't none in the cabinet. I know that. That's why I'm telling you. Any of you had them type of, you know, she, all of a sudden she just wants something. And it's always at a time that it's like, oh, come on. You, you're kidding me, right? And you know how you are. See, that's what I'm talking about. I'm up here laboring with this child of yours. Not just mine. It's yours too. It's the both of us. It didn't just take me. You were a consenting adult when we did this, so don't, don't put that on me like that. Now that is not, that's not totally what goes on in my house now. But maybe them potato chips or tacos sometimes. Cause there's a taco place nearby. Doesn't close to two in the morning, so if she gets that urge, I, I have a taste for some enchiladas. No, baby, no. I gotta meet the minister in the morning. And you know, once you're up. But as I've grown and matured, I realize that that little inconvenience of mine for a few minutes of comfort for my baby for our wives for our women that is nothing in comparison because if you ask me to get pregnant you can you can be the woman and I'm gonna stay the man okay 
Because what you go through, you know as a man you couldn't go through that. Am I, come on. And since there's nothing but real men in front of me that aren't looking to become pregnant, what she goes through, we couldn't go through that. And when that baby comes and the pain she goes through and the postpartum blues and I mean all of that, and that's why we as men have to know her nature and her value. And I know the time is really getting on me, so I just want to read a few beautiful things that the minister has given to us on the sacredness of the female. And as Sister Kendra said, you know, to my knowledge, to her knowledge, to our knowledge as students of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we don't know a better teacher, a better leader, who has done more to help us see the value and the beauty of the woman more than Elijah Muhammad and Louis Farrakhan. Is that a fact? Of all of our great leaders and teachers, where do you find in their speeches, where do you find in their books the mention of the woman? Where do you find them elevating the woman? Elijah Muhammad did more for the black woman than any other leader or teacher before him and since, except in his aider and helper and student, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And if you don't have a knowledge of the woman and aid in helping her to see her value, and help men to see and recognize and understand her value and her role, then no idea, no matter how great or good it is for the people, can be perpetuated without the aid of the woman. It is from her womb that the idea is first conceived. And it is from her womb again that the idea is extended into others. That's why any great leader is always, if he has the right idea, is looking at the right cultivation of the women so that that idea can be impregnated again and again and extended long after he is gone. The enemy knows the same thing. That's why the aim of the enemy is to destroy and kill the men of that nation, kill the men of that civilization that he chooses to attack and subdue for himself once he gets rid of the man. His aim all along was not to kill the man. The aim is to get into that place where thoughts are formed, ideas are conceived and shaped that come into reality. Why does he fear now, since he is a big man? Because the enemy put fear in them when they were what? Babies, little boys. So the slave master put fear in our women for him. And that thought of fear 
and the emotion that was created as a result of the fear of the enemy was all fed into our children.